The word family and community these days is thrown around a lot. The next time you're watching or listening to advertisements, take note of the references to family. Some are straightforward, like, we treat you as family. Sometimes it's more subtle with images of homes or relationships. And the same can be said about the word community, where politicians strike gold trying to convince us in, in our own special interest groups that our groups are communities. Just pay attention the next time a politician speaks and talks about the fill-in-the-blank community. It's great foolishness to think that community can be based upon anything but family, but God. And in our scripture today, we see two things. Number one, that God values family from generation to generation as the principal agent of refuge by which his salvation goes. But of course, what about those who have family that is not faithful? Or those whose families are of another culture? And we see in the gospel today, Jesus talk about family and leaving one's family for the sake of a greater family, for the sake of the kingdom of God, which Jesus calls a family. Did you note that? that if one leaves his or her family of this life, Jesus extends it saying, truly I tell you, if there's, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution, and in the age to come, eternal life. What's fascinating about that is Jesus throws in that word with those words, with persecution, right? That it's not going to be easy, and yet families are meant to be refuges, both our own families, naturally, and our spiritual family. In chapter 3 of the book of Hebrews, God speaks of the spiritual family. I invite you to look with me at Hebrews chapter 3 as we, con we continue our sermon series through the book of Hebrews. Let's look particularly at chapter 3, verse 6. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. What's the author talking about here? What is this speaking of sons and houses? Christ is faithful over God's house. Well, the Bible and Christians use the word house to mean more than one thing. It can literally mean a house, the structure that you live in, but it can also be your family, your household. I was trying to explain this to my catechism students last week and told them that back in the olden days, we had one phone in our house. When I was young, you would answer the house, and you'd say, hello, Templeton's, or hello, Templeton household or residence. One student proceeded to tell me that, oh yeah, my grandma told me about that, how that used to be. Hmm, has it been so long? The word house or household is what's being used here in this text. And it's also intentionally used by the author of Hebrews to talk about the house or the family of God linking this Hebrews 3 passage back to the Old Testament. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 7, God declares, My servant Moses is faithful in all my house. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 35, God proclaims to Eli, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do what is according to my heart and mind, and I will build him a sure house. Now, those scriptures aren't talking about the physical building of a house. They're talking about building out the family of God. 
And the Hebrews listening to this would have understood that because as the Hebrew people, they are God's house. They are God's people. That's why the lectionary today puts this passage with that passage from Amos. They also would have seen that they have fallen short of that and that all of us indeed fall short, but God preserves a remnant in his house. Even Romans that might read this in the first century would have understood this because to be part of a great household in Rome, even as a servant, even as a slave, was a key part of their identity. We don't understand that today. We've become so individualistic in our understanding. We think of ourselves as the center of the universe. We think that we can identify ourselves as such. We think that, indeed, we are these autonomous creatures, these blank slates that come into the world and do as we like and as we wish, and sometimes even, you know, making up what we are. We're self-made men and women, after all, as Americans. And yet, is that really true? Of course not. Of course not. All you have to do is go to your local therapist and he or she will tell you that's not the case. Families can be great blessings and of course they can also bear some baggage. But in this case, the author of Hebrews is talking about the great blessing it is to be part of the household of God. And in Hebrews 3, the author talks about Moses. Moses was that key servant in God's household. But again, just as we saw last week with the law, the author of Hebrews is here saying that greater than Moses is Jesus. Just as greater as the written law word is the living word, so greater than Moses, the taker of the living word on Mount Sinai, is Jesus. Jesus the Word made flesh, the Son appointed over even the servant of the household. Now for us, servant has a negative connotation, but that's not in the text here in Hebrews. When Hebrews talks about Moses being a servant, you could also translate that minister. Minister. It's a, it's a place of esteem. Think of, um, I'm going off script here, so don't hold me to this, but I believe, think of Eleazar with Abraham, right? That's Eleazar is the, the heir servant for Abraham, right? Yes, thank you, good. Um, Eleazar is the appointed heir even if he's a servant. And that's the case with Moses. But of course, Jesus is the son, the true heir. And of course, with Abraham, with Abram at the time, Eleazar is replaced with Isaac by God's grace. So the same is true of you and I as followers of Jesus, that in Jesus as the Son, we become sons and daughters of God's household. For baptism is that new circumcision. It's the new way of entering into the house of God. In the Old Testament, was that, that sign was circumcision, but in the New Testament, it's baptism. As someone comes to the house of God in the New Testament and becomes a member of that house. And being part of God's family, of course, is a wonderful thing. Like the great saints and martyrs who have gone before us, we should be emboldened by that status. And that's the point of the author of Hebrews here, that you, dear friend, carry with you the household of God, nothing short that your homes are extensions of sanctified ground, the church. That's why we do house blessings and building blessings and things like that, because these things are part of God's household. It's true, yes, that we're miserable sinners, and we need that reminder, as the prayer book and the scriptures continually remind us, but we're also holy ones at this point, saints because we've come to Jesus, and brothers because we've come to Jesus. Look how chapter three opens. Therefore, holy brothers. You can actually put a comma between holy and brothers. Holy can also be translated saints there. Hebrews, the author of Hebrews is trying to embolden 
trying to encourage those people who are struggling through the tumultuous world that they're going through. And so it is with us today. But Hebrews also, in this passage, gives a caution, just as Jesus gives a caution in the gospel. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 3 again, this time verses 12 through 13, where we read, Take care, of brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall from, fall away, rather, from the living God. Does anyone who prays morning prayer regularly recognize the section of Scripture between Hebrews 3.6 and 3.12, the part that's written here in verse, that begins, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today if you hear his voice, and ends with, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Does that pique anybody's ear? What's that from? That's how every morning prayer service begins. It's a portion of Psalm 95, also known as the Venite, right? Also known as the Venite. Why do you think the author of Hebrews puts that here? For the same reason, in his wake, the authors of the prayer book put that to begin every step of a Christian's walk every morning. You see, Psalm 95 reminds God's people that indeed they are God's people, the sheep of his pasture. And yet, they're warned, do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts as your forebearers did. Do you think that it's a coincidence that we're to say that every day? Of course not. We start our prayers there because we need the twin reminder of paying attention to the fact that we have received this gift of God who's made us part of his family, number one. And number two, that we are in danger if we harden our hearts to his word, if we harden our hearts to his will. Commentator Craig Coaster, in his commentary, writes this with a keen insight. He says, like the wilderness generation, who Psalm 95 speaks about, the Christian community lived in between the deliverance accomplished by Christ's death and the resurrection and entry into their internal inher eternal inheritance. So there's this comparison between us and the remnant people of God in the Old Testament. Being brought into the family of God is a wonderful thing, as I've said, but just because you've been brought in doesn't mean we can fall away. That doesn't mean that we can not pay attention or that we can never fall away from the living God. In the Greek, the word translated for unbelief in verse 19 is apista. And it doesn't mean doubt as some people sometimes think. Let's look at that verse together. Look with me, it's the final verse of today's passage. So we see that they are unable to enter because of their unbelief. That word is not doubt. That word is best translated abandonment, apostasy, unbelief. How does one walk away from the family of God? Well. The author of Hebrews tells us it begins with sin, something that's not in accordance with God's will as defined in the Bible. It continues with deceit, thinking that evil is good, and then it continues by hardening one's heart, which finally causes one to have contempt towards the things of God. Bishop and theologian Chrysostom writes this, as in bodies, the parts that have become callous and hard do not yield to the hands of the physician. So also souls that are hardened do not yield to the word of God. You see what he's saying? That just as our bodies can become callous, just as we can become hardened, just as our muscles, when not exercised, can become inflexible, so it is with our souls and our hearts that we can harden ourselves to God's word. 
that we can harden, our, harden ourselves to God's will. One doesn't just pop in and out of a family. A baptized Christian doesn't slip away into abandoning the house or the family of God. Don't worry, be assured. But sadly, like me, you've probably seen people slip away both from their earthly families and their spiritual ones. They slowly fall into sin in the case of spiritual families, sins of the mind or the body. They start to rationalize things in their mind, right? The sin that, that's their particular sin all of a sudden isn't a sin anymore, right? We're good at that as human beings. It's an age-old deception of the devil who says, did God really say you should not do that? Thing. It goes back to the Garden of Eden. And before you know it, when that happens, no longer is that person going to church. But why are, they going, why are they not going to church? They don't want to feel the condemnation. I've sadly seen this with parishioners, even here, where people don't want to face the fact. All they have to do is come and repent and confess to the Lord. But no, they would rather be deceived in their sin. Dear friends, if you're like me, you've seen it in your own lives. Hearts become hardened. Isolation creeps in. And eventually, if left unchecked, such a person becomes contemptuous of God's word and contemptuous of God's people. Not just avoiding, but condemning. Like the Hebrews in the wilderness, we're tempted every day to not trust in God, to abandon God. What's the solution? Well, the Bible in the ancient church has given us an answer. Again, look at the Hebrews passage, verse 13. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And verse 14 also following, for we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Exhort one another, dear friends, is the answer. Be together. Do life together. Bring your difficulties to one another. Bear one another's burdens. You can hear the other epistles come through and what the author of Hebrews is saying here. Encourage one another, building each other up. God will be faithful to you. You know, sometimes people think, oh, I've sinned and God's walked away from me. No, that's never the case. We walk away from him. He doesn't walk away from us. We turn away from him. He doesn't turn away from us. God is always desiring for us to repent and come back to him. And sometimes we need to hear that message too from others in the body. We read that at the end of James, right? God is with you even in your sin. And it's a lie of the devil to think, oh, because I'm sinned, I cannot go to church. Because I messed up, I cannot possibly present myself to Jesus. Jesus knows already. You're not hiding anything from him like Adam and Eve in the garden. Adam and Eve in the garden hide from God. Can you hide from God? You, we look at that, our Sunday school kids look at that, like, how silly is that? And yet, do we hide from God? Do we let our shame, do we try to keep ourselves away from the body of Christ, from the family, because we're ashamed of something? No, come and repent. Be restored to the table. Speak scripture texts to one another, like that one. Be accountable to each other, dear family of God. Don't fall away from coming on Sunday. Don't fall away from going to small groups or gathering with other believers. Remind those going through tough times that their hope and our hope is ultimately in Christ and he has not abandoned us. For 40 years, the Hebrews walked in the wilderness. Did God abandon them for 40 years? No. The church, you and I as the people of God, are in the wilderness. That's what it means to be in the time between Jesus' ascension and Jesus' coming again to judge the living and the dead. It means that we are in 
the wilderness. That's why the baptism service talks about us carrying each other in the ark of the church through the tumultuous waters and troubles of the world. It's because Jesus, however, has brought us into the family that we will survive. And indeed, we will be given a hundredfold whatever we lose here. As we pray Psalm 95 every day, and I encourage you to do so, even if you're not praying the daily office, pray Psalm 95. Be reminded, as the author of Hebrews reminds us, that you are part of the family of God, and do not let your hearts be hardened towards God, his word, or his family. God has made you his son or daughter, and you have the ability not just to survive, but to walk with him through this world. And you don't have to do that by yourself either, for you and I have each other. We have the body of Christ. That is true family. That is true community. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.